It's wonderful to be introduced by Roger. My mother would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe no one else. But let me tell you, it's a pleasure for us to be here with you. This is such a unique congregation, and I really enjoy listening to Roger and learning from Roger. I also enjoy your music. And I was really delighted this morning that it wasn't an all-male chorus. And, uh, you added charm and worth to the, uh, to the audience. I wish I could travel with you guys uh, and ladies. That would, be, that would be really wonderful. When I was asked by Roger six months ago to give him the outlines of what I plan to do this morning, it's something I really don't like to do. Contrary to what he says, I don't prepare until the week before I go to an event because I want it to be fresh. I've never used the same talk twice in my life. That didn't mean I haven't recycled some of the same material. <laughs> but one's got only a limited supply of material, but I never take an old sermon or an old lecture and deliver it a second time because I think it turns yellow with age. It lacks spontaneity. And so I don't like to give title, title six months ahead because I don't know what I'll be thinking about six months ahead. And when I looked at the bulletin last night, it gave as my title, Jesus did not die for your sins, which is exactly what I talked about last night. I didn't want to repeat that. Uh, I think most of you might have recognized it if I would repeated it. Though I, I remember a young clergyman who asked his seminary professor when he could use the same sermon in the same congregation without fear of having it being recognized. And the professor said, if you change the opening sentence and the key illustration, you can use it that evening. <laughs> and I think that's probably accurate. What I want to do with you today is to give you an illustration of how the Bible can be read and understood differently from the way most of us have been trained to read and to understand the Bible. The Bible is a Jewish book. The 66 books in the Bible, and all of them are written by Jews. There's only debate about one of them, and that's Luke. And he appears to have been born a Gentile, converted to Judaism, and came into Christianity through Judaism. So all of the authors of all of the books of the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, are written by Jewish people, all but one Jewish by birth, one Jewish by conversion. What does that mean? That means they're written by Jewish people for a Jewish audience. They can assume a common vocabulary, a common history, a common background, a common worship pattern. They don't have to explain these things to their audience because their audience will know about it. But if you take a Jewish book with Jewish assumptions based on Jewish culture and Jewish scripture and Jewish worship, and ask some Egyptians to read it, they miss all the points. Well, that's sort of what's happened in Christian history. Christianity was born in the womb of Judaism. Judaism is our mother. We spend an awful lot of time spitting on our mother in our history. Judaism is our mother. But by about 150 of this common era, there were no Jews left in the Christian movement. It had become a totally Gentile movement. And so from about 150 on, only Gentiles have been reading the New Testament, commenting on the New Testament, writing commentaries on the New Testament. And they did it with abysmal ignorance of things Jewish. And therefore, they decided that they could read the Bible literally. That would have been the furthest thing from the minds of the Jewish people, as I shall try to illustrate in just a moment. But that was the way Gentiles, ignorant of the Jewish context in which the New Testament was written, came to read it. Now, I'd like to illustrate that by taking a character who is very familiar. Everybody knows this character. It doesn't know whether you go to church or not. Doesn't matter what church you go to, everybody knows this character. His name is Joseph. He's that strong, silent type who stands behind the manger in a Napoleonic stance with his hand in his tunic, guarding the Virgin Mary, who is almost always kneeling in front of a manger. 
everybody knows Joseph. You could put that figure on a Christmas card and everybody could tell you that's Joseph, that's Mary, and that's the Christ child. But let me tell you some things about Joseph that Jews would understand that most Gentiles had never heard of. First, some biblical facts. Joseph is not mentioned in any Christian writing until the ninth decade of the Christian era. Embrace that. Nobody ever heard of Joseph until the ninth decade. He doesn't appear in any of the writings of Paul. He doesn't appear in any of the writings of Mark. He doesn't appear in any Christian writing that we can discover prior to the writings of Matthew about the year 85 in the middle of the ninth decade. So Matthew introduces Joseph into the Christian tradition in the ninth decade. He's never been heard of before. That's fact number one. Fact number two, if you look carefully at the Bible, Joseph disappears from the story as soon as the birth narratives are complete. He doesn't appear again. Or oh, a reference to his name will appear, but he never appears. The mother of Jesus appears in a number of episodes. The father of Jesus never appears again. He's a character in the birth narrative. Nobody's ever heard of him before Matthew writes the first birth narrative. He never appears after the birth narrative in any piece of Christian literature that we call Holy Scripture. Now, when I was a kid going to Sunday school in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the heart of the Bible Belt, I would say, whatever happened to Joseph? And the people would say, my teachers would say, well, he must have died when Jesus was just a lad. So he disappears from the story. And I thought about that, and it made sense. Because every time I looked at a picture of Joseph in Christian art, he was portrayed as a much older man than his wife Mary. It was so universal that one day I decided to try to find out where the tradition comes from that Joseph is a much older man. It's not in the Bible, but it's universal in Christian art. And so you go plunging back into the, in the tradition, trying to find the source of the idea that Joseph is an older man. And you go into the second century. You go into one of the apocryphal gospels that we call the the Proto-Gospel of James. It's also called Proto-Evangelicum of James. And there you find this interesting story, which became part of the Christian tradition, although it's certainly not biblical. The Proto-Gospel of James purports to tell us what happened when Mary's life from her infancy until she became the mother of the Christ child, what happened in her life. Absolutely apocryphal. Nobody has any idea what happened in her life, but they began to write stories to fill in the blanks of historic knowledge. And so it was said of Mary that she knew from infancy that she would be the bearer of the Christ child. And so she had to be meticulously prepared for this role. And so she was not raised by her family. She was raised by a group of, quote, holy women, unquote. They prepared her to be the vessel through which the Christ child would enter the world. Now, when she reached the age of puberty, they had a problem. Because in Jewish society, every female has to have a male protector. And the protector was normally a father, but if a father was not available, the husband had to be the woman's male protector. Well, there appears to be no father in the tradition anywhere, so they couldn't lean on that particular explanation. And so these holy women have to find a proper husband for Mary to be the protector of her life. Now, his primary role as her husband is to protect her virginity. Well, that sort of narrowed the field of those who might be interested in applying for the position. <laughs> and so these holy women decided that they would search for a husband for Mary who was perhaps an older man, perhaps already married, already has raised, grown children, had no desire to have any more children. Indeed, they were looking for somebody who might be so old 
that he would no longer have any interest in sex. Now, I don't know how old that is, <laughs> but that's really old. And so they narrow the field down. It's all in the Apocrypha of James. They narrow the field down to a group of elderly, widowed men. And through a series of other tests, like the staff of Joseph suddenly began to sprout lilies, Joseph gets chosen. And he becomes the husband of Mary, the protector of her virginity, so that she can be the bearer of the Christ child. It's all in this apocryphal book in the second century. And that colored the image of Joseph from that moment on. So he's always portrayed as an older gentleman. Now, let me propose another alternative. The alternative proposed is that he was a much older man and he played a specific role in the life of the Christ child. Let me propose another alternative. Maybe Joseph never lived. Maybe Joseph was a character who was created to be a literary character. Maybe Joseph was much more like Harry Potter than Governor Huckabee. <laughs> Maybe he was much more like Wonder Woman than Hillary Clinton. Maybe he was a literary character drawn by the author of Matthew's Gospel to play a role in the drama of the birth which Matthew, for the first time in Christian history, was creating. Now, I don't ask you to believe that. I just ask you to look at that as a possibility. And look at it as a possibility from the vantage point of how that story would appear to a Jewish audience. So ask yourself this question. If Matthew was creating this character out of whole cloth, why would he want to name him Joseph? Is there something about the name Joseph that would mean more to a Jewish audience than to anyone else? Well, indeed there is. If you know anything about Jewish history, you'll know that what they call the 12 tribes of Israel were really two tribes. One was the tribe of Judah, and one was the tribe of Joseph. If you remember much of biblical history, you will know that Jacob had two wives. One of them was Rachel, whom the Bible says he loved and for whom he worked for seven years to receive her as his bride from his father-in-law Laban. And then when he got married, the bride was veiled, and they didn't have electricity. And it wasn't until the morning after the wedding that, that Jacob opened his eyes and looked at his wife and found he had been married to the wrong woman. He had been married to Rachel's older sister. And she's not treated kindly in the Bible. They say of her, her name was Leah, they say of her that she had eyes like a cow. That's not terribly flattering. Popeye Leah. And Joseph was upset, or Jacob was upset, and he went to Laban and says, what is this you've done? And Laban says, well, it's just not proper for a younger daughter to be married until her older daughter is married. And so it didn't matter much in that day. You could have as many wives as you could afford. So Laban says, don't worry about it. I'll now give you Rachel to be your wife. You have two wives, but you have to work seven more years for Rachel. So in the history of the Hebrew people, there is this distinction between Leah, who is the mother of Judah, and Rachel, who is the mother of Joseph. Now, when they divided hundreds of years later, when they divided the land of Canaan into the 12 tribes of of Jacob, 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's name was changed to Israel after he wrestled with an angel, according to the biblical story. After that had been done, the fact of the matter is that Joseph doesn't have a tribe. Joseph's two sons are given tribes. One's named Ephraim, one's named Manasseh. And they are by far the largest tribes of the northern kingdom. The Levites don't have a tribe either. They become the holy people that serve all the tribes. So there really weren't but 11 sons of Joseph, of Jacob. 
and two grandsons that make up the 12 tribes. Ten, there's 10 sons plus two grandsons. Take out Levi, take out Joseph, add Manasseh and Ephraim. And so the northern kingdom, the northern part of the Jewish state, is identified with the patriarch called Joseph. Now the Jewish state stayed together until the end of the reign of King Solomon. And when King Solomon finished, when he died, they began to pass the, tr the throne on to his son Rehoboam, and he had so alienated the Jews of the north that they came and met with him under a general named Jeroboam. So you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam. I call them the Boam brothers. <laughs> negotiating about the future of the, of the nation. And Rehoboam refuses to make any concessions to the north, and Jeroboam leads a revolution, a secession, and the ten tribes of Israel pull away from the tribe of Judah. But the ten tribes of Israel are Joseph tribes. They're even called Ephraim. The southern tribe is a Judah tribe. The division in the Jewish nation is between the patriarch Joseph and the patriarch Judah. If Jesus is going to be the Messiah, the first task of the Messiah in Jewish expectation was that he had to bind together the separated Jewish nation. How better to do that than to bring Joseph and Judah together? If you read the genealogy of Matthew, that's Matthew 1, 1 through 17, that I called the 17 most boring verses in the Bible, you will discover that Jesus is said to be the descendant of King David, who was a Judah king. And the line of the David kings goes down through the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. The genealogy relates Jesus to the side of the Jewish nation that is known as Judah, the southern kingdom. Our word Jew comes from Judah. It doesn't really exist until Judah becomes the nation that stands for the whole Jewish people. Now he's got to bring the northern kingdom in. How better to do that? than to bring the earthly father of Jesus, the protector, the one who in the drama names Jesus and therefore legitimatizes Jesus, who presumably was a child without a father. So Joseph and Judah are brought together in the story of the birth of Jesus because that was a Jewish expectation and every Jew reading that story would have understood that. They would not have pretended that Joseph was some historical being. Now, if you've journeyed with me this far, let me take one further step. If you are Matthew and you are creating Joseph as a literary character in a drama that you are telling, where are you going to get the data that fills out the biography of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus? Well, there's only one place you can go to look for biographical details of this Joseph, and that is in Matthew 1 and 2, because that's the only place he's mentioned. And so if you read Matthew 1 and 2 and look for biographical details about this Joseph, you will discover three things. You'll discover that he has a father named Jacob. You will discover that God only speaks to him through dreams. No matter what happens in the life of Joseph, God communicates through a dream. It's through a dream that, that Roger read the lesson that the angel says to Joseph in a dream that this child is a holy child, not an illegitimate child. It's in a dream that this Joseph is told to flee for the child's safety in the face of King Herod. It's in a dream that he's told, it's okay now to come back to your home in Bethlehem. It's in a dream that he's told, no, it's not as safe as it used to be. You've got to go out of Bethlehem and up into the land of Galilee. God never communicates with this Joseph except in a dream. The third thing you will learn about this Joseph, if you read Matthew 1 and 2, is that his role in the drama of salvation was to save this child of promise from death. How is he going to save him? He's going to save him by fleeing down to Egypt. Now keep that in mind. Now go back into the Bible, go back to the book of Genesis, 
and read the story of the patriarch Joseph. You can find it in chapters 37 through 50 of the book of Genesis. If you search those chapters for biographical data about Joseph the patriarch, you will discover three things. One is he's got a father named Jacob. Two is that he's overwhelmingly identified with dreams. He's always dreaming dreams about how important he is. He alienates his brothers because he has a dream about their sheaths of wheat bowing down before his sheath out in the, in the fields. His brothers call him the dreamer. The story goes on to say that he rises in political power as the interpreter of dreams. He interprets the Pharaoh's butler's dream and the Pharaoh's baker's dream, and then he interprets the Pharaoh's dream and rises to power in the land of Egypt, second to the Pharaoh alone. He's overwhelmingly identified with dreams. The third thing you learn about this Joseph is that his role in the drama of salvation was to save the chosen people, the people of the covenant from death. And how does he save them? He saves them by going down into Egypt to avoid death by famine. So every detail of the Joseph in Matthew's story, where he is introduced in the Christian tradition, is identical with the detail in the story of the patriarch of ancient Israel. Now, no Gentile would have had that knowledge. No Gentile would have would have even thought that way. They would read this story and they'd have no other way to read it except literally. And so they impose upon this Jewish text a literal meaning. I have a book that's going to come out next February, next, next March, on the Gospel of Matthew. The book is entitled Biblical Literalism, A Gentile Heresy. And what I'll do with that book is in every chapter of Matthew, I will try to show how Matthew's story would be understood by the Jewish reading audience for whom it was written, and how biblical literalism comes into the Christian story only when Gentiles, who are unaware of this Jewish background, these Jewish nuances, begin to read the story and don't have any understanding of what Matthew intended. And so they, out of the ignorance of not knowing, they turn the story into literal history. So that most of us have grown up thinking of Joseph as a literal man who named Jesus, who protected Jesus, and who made the possibility of the life of Jesus available to the world. Now, I don't have time to go through the 28 chapters of Matthew. I'd like to, but the plane does leave this afternoon about 4 <laughs> o'clock. But let me just suggest a couple of hints. Did Jesus really feed 5,000 people in the wilderness with five loaves and two fish? Or if you were Jewish, would you not recognize that as a retelling of the story where Moses fed the multitude of Jews in the wilderness with heavenly bread, with manna from on high. If you know the background of the story, you don't get trapped into the literal alternative. It is out of our ignorance of the scriptures, out of our ignorance of things Jewish, that we have imposed upon the Bible a literal accuracy that makes no sense to modern men and women, but it also made no sense to the original Jewish writers. So what we're doing is not trying to destroy the Bible, as fundamentalists so often like to say. We're trying to recall the Bible to its original meaning, and in the process, free the minds of modern 21st century men and women to read these holy texts with a new kind of integrity. I expect that book to be controversial. I expect it to be provocative. But above all else, I expect it to be freeing because it will help us carry the Bible as a sacred text into the future of the 21st century without having to twist our minds 
into first century pretzels in order to try to understand it. The Bible is a good book. It's a Jewish book. It's filled with profound meaning, but it's got to be read with Jewish eyes or through a Jewish lens, or you inevitably become a fundamentalist. Amen. Amen. You have been watching a progressive Christian video from the Community Christian Church of Springfield, Missouri. We encourage our viewers to donate to our efforts in feeding the homeless and hungry of our community. Write to us at Reverend Dr. Ray at AOL.com for more information.